thanks so much to all of our presenting sponsors that you see in front of you on the screen. These organizations, I, I'm going to say it because I really love saying this, Julia. They like us. They like Julia. They like me, but they love you. Like they love the work you're doing. They love the missions that you're you're driving forward and the causes that you're serving in your community. So they're not really here for the episodes. They're here for each and every one of you throughout our nation. So check them out. Amazing presenting sponsors. Um, if, if you want to become a sponsor, we'd love to talk to you about what that looks like as well. Um, speaking of community from our chitty chat chat with our guest, Rich Dietz, like our sponsors are a big part of our community as well. So I uh, just want to plug that in there. Thanks to Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm Jarrett Ransom, also known as the Nonprofit Nerd, CEO of the Raven Group. And I am really excited for all of our guests this week. We continue to, I think, Julia, like this week is better than last. And the, yeah, the I agree. week is better than the, you know, yeah. and it continues yeah. to evolve. Yeah. But today I really want us to, to hone in, take a look at the screen because we have rich Dietz joining us. Um, and Rich is the director of peer to peer solutions at one cause. Um, Rich, welcome, first of all, but I want I want to make note and acknowledge that you called yourself the grandfather of peer to peer. Well, maybe it is an old man, an old man of, of uh, peer to peer. I'm, I'm grandfather age when it comes to peer to peer. Yeah. Great. <laughs> so been, well, I, we're glad to have you thrilled that one clause. Um, you know, loosen the reins, not, th not that that's the culture, but loosen the reins to have you on today. And uh, just thrilled to learn more. And as I always say, nerd out about, you know, the topic. I love it. I love it. I'm super excited. I love talking about peer to peer. It's my favorite topic in the world. Been doing it since early 2000s, 2003 ish. That's why I call myself the old man of, of a peer to peer. Not many people that have been doing it that long. Um, and I'm a huge fan of it and want to dig in and talk more about it. Well, awesome. we're really thrilled to have you here because Peer-to-peer -peer is such an um, interesting part of the culture of fundraising and philanthropy. It has so many nuances, and I think we'll, we'll pick your brain today because a lot of those nuances have changed even more because of the pandemic. And so I think the best place is if you could start us out with defining peer-to-peer. -peer. We think we know it, yeah. but let's hear from the, the OG. Yeah, I love that, the OG. All right, I love I'm, I'm, I'm going to steal that. I'm going to totally steal that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so peer-to-peer, -peer, I love to talk about peer-to-peer -peer and defining it is a great first step because I will tell you really clearly when I say peer-to-peer, -peer, I don't mean run, walk, ride. I mean, yes, a run, walk, or a ride is the traditional sort of peer-to-peer. -peer. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you, it's my least favorite type of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Um, and I'll tell you why, because it's difficult to organize and pull off a walk, a run, or a ride. It's a lot of effort, it's a lot of cost, it's a lot of stuff. And so peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is so much more than that. So my definition of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is just allowing your supporters to fundraise on your behalf. Mm -hmm. So it is taking hundreds of employees that you don't have to pay for, they're free workers that are out there asking their friends and family for money, bringing it back to your organization um, and, and doing that. I think that is the key. It's just letting them ask for money. and this happened way before we even had technology. So we've been doing peer-to-peer -peer fundraising since caveman days. I mean, if you talk to someone and you tell them about someone, uh, yep. an organization that you like, and you tell them to go check them out, that's technically peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Yep. What we've done now is we've created tools, software tools that allow you to do it a lot easier. Um, and, and that's where it, where it gets really exciting. And at the end, we're going to talk about what is my favorite type of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, and I'll just tease it up. It's called DIY, do it yourself. So we'll talk about that later at the end. So stay tuned to the end. Um, nice and, plug. And, and we'll get deeper into that. <laughs> wow, Jared. I mean, your position here as co-host is getting, a, I, I don't know. <laughs> no, it's not, because I saw the hat he has ready and available. Well, to that's true. The <laughs> there's, um, there's a, yeah, because I, I, I don't wear Dodger blue. Somebody <laughs> said, oh, I love your Dodger blue. I'm like, oh, that just went into the Goodwill bag. Yeah. Well, so this is great, and I, I love the uh, the banter that we're having. But I want to say, and really, again, like peer to peer, I believe, uh, Rich, is something that we all need. Like, truth be told, we all need more money. All, every single organization, every single nonprofit, could do more with more resources. Mm -hmm. And with that comes that peer to peer, and we could all benefit from having more ambassadors, advocates, cheerleaders, right? Like 
in our community. So why wouldn't we engage in this? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think the biggest thing is fear. People are afraid it's going to be too much work or it's not going to work or, you know, think things of that nature. And so, you know, my advice always when I'm dealing with nonprofits and technology is just start small. Um, try some smaller campaigns or DIY, like we're going to talk about in, in a little bit here, um, and just get out there and start doing it. Um, and I think, you know, one of the best ways, I mean, just thinking about it is it's recruiting those ambassadors for that campaign. So I think the next slide that you just pulled up is, is the perfect segue there, is you have folks out there that want to help you do this now, and you're just giving them the opportunity to do it. Um, we just worked with an organization that's a perfect example, um, Cosgrove Animal Shelter um, launched a DIY peer-to-peer -peer campaign on our platform. And the reason they did it is because they said during the pandemic, they had hundreds of volunteers that were just sitting at home. They couldn't come in and volunteer at the shelter anymore. They couldn't do anything. So they started this online campaign saying, you want to help us come here, sign up. You can help us fundraise. And they had hundreds of people come and sign up and the money just started rolling in. I mean, people want to help and you're just giving them that opportunity um, to help. Amazing. You know, do you feel like sometimes there's um, a sense that this interferes with a development director's team um, versus some, somebody that's a little bit more grassroots? Um, I was working with somebody just in the last couple of weeks and they were like, the development team wants us to send a list of everybody we're going to invite to our peer to peer to see if there's any you know, poaching, that was their word, poaching. But I'm wondering, you know, when you're recruiting ambassadors and everybody's all excited and gung-ho, is that a, something to be worried about, stepping on others' toes? That's, that's an interesting question. I, I have had that come up a couple of times where people are worried, you know, where, you know, where are they going to be coming from, and the whole poaching thing, you know. And, you know, I've had organizations look at this in different ways. One is peer-to-peer -peer could be a great way to fill your top of funnel and find out who your future major givers will be, right? You know what I mean? So a great way to bring people in. But what I think is even more important is, uh, so One Cause did a, a study about two years ago called the Social Fundraiser Study. And in that study, fundraisers told us they were two times as likely to be recruited by a friend or family member than by the organization themselves to come and join that campaign. Because it's it's just more trustworthy. If the, if the Red Cross reaches out to me and says, we want you to come do something, I'm like, whatever, it's the Red Cross. If my mom says, I want you to come and join me at this campaign with the Red Cross, I kind of have to do it. It's, I jokingly call it blackmail fundraising, right? Because I kind of have to do it now because she told me to, right? And so use those, those fundraisers, those supporters, those volunteers to find their friends and family that are like-minded to also come in. That's going to feed your donor database. That's not going to poach from it. It's actually going to grow it and uh, make it a lot larger. It's the social influence, right? It really is that social influence. Um, I love that. And, and I wish more people saw it that way because it's the truth. If we go to a restaurant, right, and we love it, we're going to tell someone or better yet, we're going to take someone with us the next time that we meet them for lunch or dinner. So why wouldn't we do this for our organizations? Um, I love this too often, Rich, I hear from clients or just anyone, right? And I call it the F word fundraising. Like people don't want to fundraise. They're scared. They're intimidated. But let me tell you, people give because they're asked, right? So back to peer to peer people, I believe will participate because they're asked. So that to me is like the basics. 100%. People want to give and people are giving. I, I had talked to so many organizations said, oh, well, for COVID, we're not going to fundraise this year because, you know, people got enough on their plate. And I'm like, no, like they are. I, I guarantee you, if, if you don't ask them, someone else is going to and they're going to donate right. to them because we saw giving some organizations raise more virtually than they did at their in-person uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 events because it made it so much easier and they could do it from home and they were reaching audiences they never reached before because they did it virtually. I, I think it's just a huge opportunity. So let's talk about that because I agree with you and, and Jarrett and I, with you know, we've done now almost 300 shows, we have seen on a daily basis, those organizations that come and, and chat with us during a nonprofit show, who've leaned in, who've done things virtually, they, it seems to me, Jared, wouldn't you agree that actually they've been surprised? You know, oh, they they've kind of been like, surprised. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, like, like thinking, this isn't going to work, yeah. but it has. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, yeah, the whole virtual world, I, it's, I think we were talking a little bit, I think, before the camera started rolling here um, about, you know, maybe maybe COVID was kind of the kick in the rear that some people needed to, to think outside the box. So so one cause is really known for event fundraising. Right. And so when all the live events went down, we you know, we had to pivot as a company. Now, peer to peer could always be virtual, has always been has virtual component. But we had to think about that virtual component for all fundraising and especially event type fundraising. So. We've helped over 9,000 events go virtual, you know, over this time. And we found some really amazing things that I think is going to change fundraising in the future, just like you were talking about, Jared, uh, before we started here, uh, which is basically virtual, I don't think is ever going to go away because of this. Because what we found is even people that were doing live events like the gala, but we've seen it in peer to peer as well, is by making it virtual, they tap new audiences. So if someone was a huge fan of your organization and they moved to New Jersey two years ago, they couldn't come to your live event anymore, but now it's virtual. I could watch it online. I could become a fundraiser. I, I could donate uh, or bid on auction items. I could do everything I want from my home. I can now participate and, and support you when I'm not even there. And then we had all the people that don't feel comfortable going out. So even as events come back live, donors are telling us, I don't know if I feel comfortable going to a large event, but if I can do it virtually, I will. So why would you not open up that new revenue stream and, and think of that, that sort of virtual world? Yeah. May I also make a plug for yesterday's masterclass I did on engaging children in philanthropy, because this virtual space also allows multi-generational audiences. And therefore, you as an agency, you are now cultivating and stewarding your future givers, your future donors, your future volunteers. So that. to embrace this virtual event, right? Like, don't say, oh, I'm so glad we're getting back to events now. We'll never do virtual again. Like, I think that also will miss the mark, Rich, and that we really need yeah. to make sure that we incorporate um, maybe with our IRL, as Julia says, in real life, that we also continue some form or fashion of this virtual space because there's so many benefits. Well, and there's so much more fun things you can do virtually as well. It's like a live event. So, so one, I always say, you'll never get me to go to a gala. I am not a gala guy. Like I, I don't like getting dressed. I'm wearing shorts right now. Like I don't like getting dressed up. Like there's just no way. But if you had a, if you have a barbecue event with live music, I'm, I'm all over that. You do a virtual sort of thing. I'm all over that. So virtual lets us do so much more, engage different audiences. You know, you can do things like um, we did a lot of fitness tracking with peer to peer um, over the last year. Instead of having that 5K, we can actually track your fitness virtually. So you connect your 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 Fitbit to, to Strava, and then we can track that on the back end. So we had people walk a walk a marathon or run a marathon over the course of three weeks instead of doing it on on that event day virtual allows us to do to do that sort of thing um, so you can do all kinds we had people doing zoom happy hours um, and then that 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 was their fundraiser you had to pay twenty dollars to come attend you know what i mean and you can allow participants to create those those events themselves so there's just there's so many more creative what uses that you can do with um with, with virtual oh, i one more example i have to tell you because this one was hilarious is uh within the one cause peer-to-peer -peer platform people can do challenges so they can create a challenge and have people donate and we had a woman that um hated pickles and she said if she could raise $250, she would eat a pickle, film it, and upload it to YouTube for her friends and family to see. And so people came and donated to her page. She had to record, <laughs> eat the pickle. And so you can get really, like, that doesn't happen at a gala. Like, I, guarantee I that, love that. that. At a gala. <laughs> Do you know how much she raised for that? I, I have no idea. She was trying to raise $250 is, is, is all I saw. So I don't know how much she raised. but I wonder... Uh, so the YouTube culture is huge, right? I have a 10 year old son and I talked a lot about him yesterday in the children in philanthropy. He watches all of these crazy things yeah. about if I get X amount of subscribers, I'll, I'll make this concoction, right? Yep. Um, and, and, and video it. But Drew Barrymore on her show, she's doing the same thing. It's, it's crazy on her midday, like kind of, and now I'm home. And so I might turn it on while I'm eating yeah. lunch. Yeah. Same thing. So even as simple as like eating a pickle becomes a peer to peer fundraising campaign. hundred percent. I love it. Yeah, I love it. So, you know, you've been talking about this um, in terms of how normally we would have done a peer to peer piece. And, and one of the things that I'd love for you to talk about is that marketing piece. And it sounds to me like you know, one of the blessings of the virtual world is that we can get these people to engage with us. You know, your pickle fundraiser, that wasn't all her family, I'm sure, and friends. I'm sure that at some point that leaked out. Mm -hmm. And could you talk to us about that? Because 
how comfortable should these ambassadors or people involved in this be with marketing? Yeah, so it's one of those big things. So it's one of the challenges with with peer to peer that that I found doing this for a long time. So as professional fundraisers, we know how hard it is to ask people for money. If you've never done it before, it's downright petrifying, right? And so we want to give them the tools, the resources, and that, that comfort level with with asking people for money. So we allow them to do it in different ways. So something like the pickle challenge, right? That gives them. A, I'm not just asking my friends and family, "Hey, give me 50 bucks," right? Because that's uncomfortable. But hey, I'm doing this funny thing. If you want to donate, then I'll do it. That's an easier ask. So that gets really creative, right? And then we want to give them the tools and the ways that they feel comfortable doing it. And so you know, you want a bit text messaging. You want them to be able to share it on on social media. You want them. I mean, email. I'm going to going to blow your minds here, but email still works. Like, you know, every, every, everyone gets down on email, you know, and email open rates and all that stuff. Email still works. <laughs> like people can still send out emails and people respond to my emails every day. It's amazing. Right. So there's still that. And then like we were talking before the call started, Julie, um, direct mail, direct yes, mail is mail. not dead. And the, one of the best ways to engage millennials now can be with direct mail. Um, it's one of those funny things. I, I've talked to millennials about this. And I think one of the reasons is, is they don't get a ton of mail. Right. right. So suddenly they get something in the mail and they're excited. They scream, I've got mail. They yeah. don't realize why that's funny because they never had an AOL account like I did. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but that takes me back to the to, to the old man uh, days as well. Yeah, the OG. It's, a unique, OG. it's a unique, different way um, to engage. And so thinking about all those channels and what we found within our platform, we give people all those channels to communicate with and then they can use whatever they, they want to do. And we see success in all of all of those all of those channels for sure. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, you know, I think that also helps to, you know, we, we keep talking about this, but the um, ability to share the message and, and cultivate new supporters, um, this comes back to the agency or the organization in such a way that they probably could never do themselves. 100%. 100%. Oh. And it's, you know, people yeah. trust their friends and family members and, and coworkers much more than they trust some random organization, and especially when it comes to something like text messaging. So within our platform, we allow the fundraiser, we don't send a text message from one cause to their friends and family because they don't know that phone number. They don't know who we are. We have the, the we forward it to the fundraiser, then the forward, the fundraiser forwards it from their phone. So their friends and family recognize the phone number, recognize the name. I don't know about you, but I get so much text spam now, especially during the election and and post-election, like I'm not going to click on a link in some random text, that you, you, you know, that I get. And so, giving them those those ways to communicate and that real one-to-one -one way is is what peer-to-peer -peer is all about. I love that. I and love really that. embracing those multi-channels because that's when we really see the ROI, return on investment. But you're leveraging your ROR, which is your return on relationships. So it's yes. really all, you know, I love that. simpatico. I love that. Yeah. Uh, are we at the point where you're going to tell us your favorite peer to peer? I would love there? to. I would love, yeah. oh, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm so, I mean, my, my pulse is quickening now. now the, 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 the closer, closer we get to this. All right. So yeah, we can, we can jump in. My favorite is DIY. So it's called okay, do it yourself go, fundraising. Um, it's yeah. Let's get this slide. There we go. DIY, DIY, do it yourself fundraising. Some people can call it fundraise your way. Um, it's becoming the hottest method of fundraising. And what I love about it is it, the easiest campaign to launch. I firmly believe that every nonprofit in the world should have a DIY peer-to-peer -peer campaign on their site. And all this means is giving your supporters a way to come and sign up, get a fundraising page and fundraise in any way that they want to. So we've seen Facebook has been exploding with birthday fundraisers, right? Yes. So I'm not the hugest fan because Facebook's great. They make it really easy. They don't charge the nonprofit any fees or anything like that but they don't give the nonprofit that donor data. The information. To me, Thank you for, as for a fundraiser, that. yes, yeah, that donor data is worth, is worth 100 times more than the yeah. check that I'm going to get um, that's right. on Facebook, right? So we want them to get them on our page. So that's all DIY fundraising is, is it's like a birthday campaign, but it could be so much more. So it could be donate your birthday. It could be a memorial tribute. It could be a third party fundraising event. I want to do a socially distanced backyard barbecue. I'm going to charge $20 for people to come. And that money is going to go directly to the nonprofit of, of, of my choice. It's just giving them the tools in order to do that. Super easy to set up. You don't have to have a walk. You don't have to have an expensive venue and food and rubber chicken and all of that sort of stuff. It's very cheap um, and, and, and easy to launch. That is so great. Wow. And when it comes to one of the topics we're talking about, you know, 
is this taking away from the development officer? Is it poaching? Like kind of what does that look like? I'm assuming when it comes to your platform and hate to say it, but probably others, right? There is an opportunity for the development officer to provide the narrative, to provide the impact, to provide elements that are brand aware, like conscious, right? So you're not telling another story. You're still in line with the story of the agency. And now he, she, or they have created this DIY package that is rinse and repeat. Am I, am I understanding that? Definitely, 100%. Is it, the organizations that do really well on this are helping coaching their fundraisers to be better fundraisers. So giving them sample social media posts, sample emails that, that they can send out, click of a button really easy. They can, of course, edit That's it, smart. put their own spin, but make it really, really easy to do. So they still control that messaging and stuff out there, but then they put the power in, in the hands of others. And like I said, it's great for feeding that top of the funnel, building that 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 donor database, bringing more people in. And some of those people could be cultivated into major donors. So the major donor, people should be excited about that. Like, show me who these people are. Let me cultivate that relationship. I'm, I'm going to find some diamonds. Um, in That's that. exactly what I'm thinking. So when I, I'm visually, you know, seeing the page, I'm seeing these campaigns from the DIYers. I'm seeing that these individuals are just kicking butt when it comes to raising money, right? Why wouldn't I engage in conversation with this individual? Why wouldn't I want to ask, you know, them to get involved in some other level? That really to me makes talks about like pulse increasing. Yeah. That really excites me because what a great opportunity to embrace another champion, right? To your cause. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Okay, so I, oh, good, we, don't, good. we don't have much time left, but I've got to drill down. So I'm wondering, so we, we go to one cause, we can see, or we go to our organizations, they, they've got their DIY pages set up. So that means that 24 seven, you're going to have different people doing different things and it's a, it's a stop and it's a hard stop date and time. No, what I love about DIY is it runs 365 days a year. This is something you have up going. So most nonprofits get approached by people saying, Hey, I want to fundraise for you. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to do a bake sale. I want to go run this marathon. Like, and I want to fundraise for you. And they're like, okay, so I've got to set up a page and I've got to like build this donation form. And I, and this, once the campaign is set up, you just say, oh, that's great. Go to this URL, go to our website, click this link. You can set up your own page. People are just doing it all the time. And then all you do is you market it in your newsletter. You mentioned that you have it. So every month, if it's November, you want to remind me that you have a DIY so I can come and donate my, my, my birthday, which is in November. So you guys can send me gifts. So, so that'd be great. Uh, so like you want to just constantly be reminding them and it's up all year round. People are always coming and signing up. There, there doesn't have to be a big event. Um, you just keep talking about it and it's yeah, evergreen. So I was going to ask that question. So you are right on point. So how do we market it? Um, one question, which you just shared, you know, newsletter is a great place to do that. But secondarily, Rich, how do we tell, demonstrate the impact of these DIY campaigns, right? So I am picturing, you know, I would love that when we say, you know, hey, don't forget every, you know, everybody has a birthday, select your birthday month, Rich's is November and he's raising for X, Y, and Z, but we could also say what October raised. Is that is yeah. that something you would recommend? Definitely. Yeah. No, I love, I love that. I also love to, so I love to talk about, you know, uh, within the campaign, you can have a thermometer up there. You can show how much you've raised so far this year, which gets really exciting, but you can also highlight your top fundraisers. So in the newsletter, I recommend saying, oh, and you know, here, here's Jen and Jen did, you know, two, two barbecues in her backyard. She donated her birthday. She's helped raise $10,000 for the organization. And the key, and you guys know this is, and this is what that means. That That's now right. means we can serve 500 more kids in the after school program, all because of Jen. Thank you, Jen. Jen feels amazing. Jen's going to go tell all her friends and family. I was just highlighted in the newsletter. Come and check this out. Right. And then more people are going to come and sign up. It's yeah. hey, Rich, this is, oh, <laughs> go ahead. oh, okay. Inspire the friendly friendly. Well, I was going to ask a question that is a little bit personal, but this is twice you've mentioned barbecue. What is the barbecue like in Minnesota? <laughs> Nowhere near Texas. So I will say there, there are two things I miss from Texas, Torchy's tacos and, and, and barbecue are, are, are the two biggest things I miss from Texas. And the Texas oh. folks on the call know exactly what I'm talking about. I love it. So you're, I, I, I'm just fascinated with this concept. And, and when we talk about this competition, I love that these pages are up and that then you can be tagging back 
to these individuals, it's not just internally, you're not talking about the competition internally, you're actually talking about that through the ambassadors. And coming to mind, I'm thinking about board members. It seems to me that organizations should people, I'll get hate mail for this, but should instantly put their board members and get each one of their board members a page. 100%. I love one board can, fundraising campaigns. One can eat a pickle. The other can shave their head. Somebody exactly. else can, I don't know, like have yeah. a pie in the face. Yeah, yeah no, I, 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 I think that's great. I think getting that competition going, especially with board members, it could be major donors. Um, we're seeing a lot of corporations. So you can have a company that comes and wants their employees to compete. What a great way to engage your, your, your sponsors. Um, and the other thing I really want to say on this friendly competition is for me, a big pain point with coming up in peer to peer and doing this is all the competition was always based on fundraising. How much money ha have you brought in? Um, and that felt not as genuine to me. And so within our platform, we've actually built some other ways that people can compete. So people can compete on a social media uh, leaderboard who, who shares the most on social media. They can compete on a recruiting leaderboard who recruits the most people to come and join the event and also become fundraisers. Because if you get people doing those things, you're going to raise more money. So it doesn't always have to be about money. As you mentioned earlier, that, that engages those younger supporters. Those younger supporters are way better on social media and have a way better uh, uh, you know, friends and family that they could recruit and bring in than maybe your large um, donors. And so a great way to, to, to build that out. Yep. Yeah. It, it oh. kind of reminds me of superlatives, right? You can't just have one superlative. You have to have like, you know, maybe the largest gift that came in or the most amount of gifts that came in or the, the amount of shares on social media, like shared, not stocks, but um, really looking at that. I love that. And I love that one cause has really identified the benefit of that. Um, Julia, pull it back up. Well, I want to share I know. Make sure everyone knows how to get in touch with Rich, how to check out One Cause, um, how to play in their space and their platform on peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. So this was so great and uh, just so thrilled that you would come and nerd out with us. Thank you. Always happy to join. Always happy to join and talk fundraising. It's my favorite thing to do. Well, it's fascinating and I love this. I think that, um, you know, peer-to-peer -peer as, as an evolution is where we need to be in so many ways and in so many formats. And I love that you all have been able to be at the right place at the right time and be creative with this, the impacts of this pandemic. Um, I mean, it's really powerful. So good job, One Cause. We're just thrilled that, that you would come and, and spend uh, time with us. Again, I'm Julia Patrick. I've been joined by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jarrett Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. Um, Again, we want to thank our sponsors. Without you, we would not be having these amazing conversations. And we love Rich, even though he is a Dodgers fan. <laughs> we'll give him that. But I learned a lot. I'm really, really intrigued um, to even talk about this more. Um, 30 minutes just isn't enough time because this is just such, um, I think it, in so many ways, Rich, it's a basic concept, but we all need to be putting this into our vocabulary and our process and so really important hey we just announced yesterday that we're launching a new show called fundraising events tv Woohoo! those I are can... my fireworks by the way yeah thank you <laughs> i love it flower sequins money and food yeah. it says it all but this is <laughs> going to be a new show that we're partnering with jason champion who many of our viewers have seen before on our show and um, it's going to be on tuesdays and thursdays it'll be a live show and uh, you'll be hearing more about it. So we just wanted to bring that up because it's really an exciting opportunity for us. When okay. does it start? Because it starts, starts in June. June. <clears throat> I know, it yeah. starts in June. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay, perfect. Maybe if you play your cards right, Jared, we'll get you to be one of our guests. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll see if I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Rich and I are going to be eating barbecue. That's I have a right. feeling because you won me over with that. <laughs> well, you should have the peer-to-peer -peer barbecue eat off. Oh, there we go. Something bake off or, yeah. or whatever you do. You don't Smoke. bake it, but yeah. Barbecue off. Barbecue yeah. off. <laughs> as simple as that. Well, hey, this has been great. Rich, again, thank you. Thank you for um, your time. And thank you to One Cause for um, you know, really investing in this process. I think it's super exciting and um, we're really interested in hearing more and, and learning more about it. 
Jared, another great show mm. tomorrow, action packed the rest of the week. We got lots cooking, but as we like to end every show, we want to remind everyone to stay well so you can do well. <laughs>